Shame has no choice but to pray. Shame has no choice but to live in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Shame has no choice but to pray. Shame has no choice but to live in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Shame has no choice but to pray. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Shame has no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave. Spread my wings, open my life Like an eagle, his home is the sky I'm gonna catch the wind, I'm gonna catch the wind Your faithfulness will never let me down I'm confident I'll see your goodness now. I know you hear my heart, I'm singing. I'll 
Good morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Church. We're glad you're here with us. I want to remind everyone today is Family Sunday, so anyone above the age of nursery should be in this room. And hopefully you haven't left somewhere somewhere else. A um, few announcements to talk about. Um, there's a night coming up for the ladies that's called uh, Love Life Girls Night In. And it's going to be a Joyce Meyer uh, simulcast. And that's on the 11th of September at 645. And is that going to be right here in the in the sanctuary, Jenny? Okay. So ladies, mark that down. Uh, Worship and Warfare on uh, Wednesday night from 7 to 8. If you haven't participated in that, I encourage you to do so. It's been really, really good. It's a good night to be together in the Lord. Uh, the blessing box is out front on the parking lot by the mailbox if you'd like to leave food for that. Or you can leave it in the vestibule and we'll put it in there for you. Uh, there's a Widow Connect uh, meeting coming up on the 17th of September. So if you're part of that group, please mark your calendar. If you need more information, you can contact Brother Dale. And his cell phone number is there in the bulletin. Marcella's Kitchen. It's good to see you, Miss Marcella. Told me she was here last week. I missed out. I didn't see her. They still, believe it or not, they need more volunteers. How many meals are y'all giving out now, Miss Marcella? For August, 4,000, good grief. And she does that all by herself, so. But anyway, they need volunteers. Her number's in the bulletin. They would love to hear from you. There's lots of ways to help from delivering food to helping prepare food to cleaning up to all kinds of things. And uh, and usually those folks only help every other week or so, don't they? Yeah, so it's not like you got to go every day. It's not like a, a job. But uh, if you could help once every two weeks, that'd be a huge blessing. Um, if y'all want to go ahead and stand up, we're going to pray for some folks in our church family that need to touch from God. And then we're going to enter right into worship. Lord Jesus, you're so, so good to us. And right now, Lord God, we lift up Tabitha Neal's family, God, in the passing of her stepmom. God, I just pray you bring comfort and healing and uh, just encourage them. Thank for your promise of heaven to those that believe. And uh, God, just bless them today. And we pray for Emily Dulworth, God. We pray for a miracle of healing. We pray for good reports. Just be with this young lady. God, touch her in Jesus' name. Uh, continue to touch Megan Clope. Give her a full recovery, God. We pray for a miracle there. Uh, continue to touch Lori Colburn and uh, Judy Runkle, these that are battling cancer. God, we know the Lord Jesus uh, bore stripes on his back for the healing of our bodies. And we speak that over them right now. In Jesus' name, they are healed by your stripes. God, continue to touch Brother Dale Barkley. Heal his hip totally and completely in Jesus' name. For Brother Bob Wright, for Orville Howard, for Hunter Crum, for Adam Tarnowski, God, we speak healing over them. We pray for good reports in Jesus' name. Father God, we lift up our uh, nursery workers today, God. Uh, empower them and strengthen them today. Be with our worship team as they lead us into worship, God. We pray a, a mighty blessing over them. We pray, Lord God, that as we enter into this time together, of worshiping you, we just pray that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, will be glorified at Christian Fellowship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Just uh, later on, we're going to be doing communion uh, through worship. So if you haven't got a cup, there's a table in the foyer, in the entrance of the church. So go get your cups at any time. Um, all right? So welcome. Jesus, we're here for you. Did you feel? Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing out, Jesus Christ is the people. Did you 
Thank you, Lord. We're about to enter into communion. And if you're at home, I want to welcome you this morning, joining us online, give you a moment to go get your elements. And if you haven't received them here yet and didn't get the announcement there on the table in the foyer in front of the uh, stained glass window, thanks, Scott, uh, you can go get those now. As you're getting those, Brother Ronnie, why don't you come on up and share what the Lord just spoke to you this song makes me want to scream because I know what I'm sharing today and I hope that you're hearing these words and it's resonating in your spirit. There's always a song. You know, God has never failed us no matter what we're
Also a second part of that, because of what He did for us, because He gave us His all, just like Ronnie said, it demands our all. We've been talking about commitment and the cost of following Jesus. Following Jesus is not a halfway thing. Because Christ gave us His all. I love that phrase, bondservant, a slave by choice. Somebody that has devoted themselves to the cause of Christ. And they see themselves as a slave by choice to the kingdom of God. Jesus did not hold back from us. As a matter of fact, His body was broken for us. He says, on the night before He was betrayed, He took the bread and He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you that you gave us your all. You endured so much torture and pain. You endured so many lashes by the stripes on your back. You endured so much chastisement as the weight of the entire world was on your shoulders. But you did it willingly because you love us. And we receive today with grateful hearts. You can receive the bread. And in like manner, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you eat it and do it in remembrance of me. Guys, we've been talking about this. Jesus spilled his blood for us. It's rare that somebody will die, even for a friend. But God displayed His great love for us in the fact that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me tell you something. You can never do anything to add to this. You can never do anything to take away from it. When Jesus said it was finished, it truly was finished. There's nothing lacking in the broken body and the spilled blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank You that we are saved today. We stand here today as freed men and women bought with a price, a heavy price by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank You that we are no longer slaves to the law of sin and death. You've set us free. But we are free and alive in Christ because of Your atoning work. And we receive it today. We proclaim You are the risen Son of God. You are God in human flesh. You are a member of the triune eternal God. You are deity. You are the Son of God. And you are our Savior. And we profess today your worth. And we receive with grateful hearts what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can receive. And Lord Jesus, as we enter back into worship, just like that word Ronnie said, now is our job. We devote ourselves to you, Lord, as your people. We consider ourselves as Paul did. We are slaves now, Lord bond servant, slaves by choice to the kingdom. And we devote ourselves to you. And as we continue in worship, Lord, we pray that you will inhabit our praises, Lord, as we make your name great in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Desperation, I turn to heaven and spoke your name into them. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine?
enough, Jesus. You're the Lord. You are the Lord. And we proclaim you the Lord of our lives, of our home, of our church, of our school. We proclaim you the Lord of this nation, Lord. And we bow our knees to you, King Jesus. Because without you, we're nothing. Apart from you, we have nothing. We submit ourselves to your Lordship today, Lord. And we thank you, God, for your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, you can be seated as you are. Once again, I want to welcome everybody that's joining us online here today from home. We miss you guys and are anxiously awaiting getting to see your face soon. I want to echo Scott's sentiment, and I want to invite everybody out, if you haven't been coming, to Wednesday night worship and warfare. It's just been so intimate and just a sweet time in the presence of God. It's not a service to be entertained or anything like that. It's a service to come seek the face of God. I wouldn't even call it a service. It's a time to come seek the face of God over our lives, our home, our nation, and Every other thing, there's prayer points up on, and it only lasts an hour, but I encourage you, you will not regret it. 
if you've come. Uh, how many people have been coming out on Wednesday nights and joining us? It's just been such an awesome time together. <clears throat> I know that these past five weeks have not necessarily been sermons that anybody wanted to hear. They've certainly not tickled anyone's ears. But I want to be honest, we live in unprecedented times. And I've been speaking in the manner that I have very intentionally and on purpose because in these unprecedented times, I want you to make it. You know, there's things that we could focus on that the truth is it won't hold us. And when they're tested, our faith will crumble. I want us to make it and get to the other side, thriving, following Jesus. We spoke on getting rid of every other message and agenda and getting back to the pure gospel. We talked about how to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to live. We talked about surrendering our rights and choosing the kingdom more than my own freedom. Last week, we talked about counting the cost of following Jesus, the price of true commitment. And all I did was read Jesus' words himself. But today, I want to talk about a topic that's probably going to be just as unpopular but needed. I want to talk about God's view of suffering. And I want to make this statement, and I want to expound upon it. And I want you to write this down. Your trial is the greatest platform that you will ever have for Jesus Christ. I'll say it again. Your trial. didn't say your mountaintop, although you can give glory to God in the mountains. Your trial, your suffering, is the greatest platform that you will ever have for Jesus. And I'll be honest, life gets hard sometimes. And usually when I find myself in that place, just like you do, the first thing that I pray is, God, take this away from me. Make this disappear. Take away the pain. Take away the suffering. Take away the trial. Get me out of here. And I'm not saying that's not appropriate to pray at times, but it's not necessarily God's view. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you can be turning there with me. Second Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to be beginning in verse 23. How many people would say, I'm in the midst of a suffering and a trial right now? Oh, good, two people, awesome. Man, you guys are great. <laughs> You're walking through the mountaintops right now. If we don't learn how to do this and point to God in our sufferings, the truth is we'll never amount to much in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. I want you to listen to what Paul, one of the greatest men, if not the greatest man of God to ever walk the planet. We have most of the New Testament because of him and his obedience. I want you to listen to his story. He's talking about other people. He said, Are they servants of Christ? He says, I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. Some people have thought, Richie, you're a madman. Well, I'm kind of like Paul, I guess, in that. Thanks, Jenny. I I thought it was funny. Uh, She's learned after 19 years to just laugh. When I kind of snicker, she's like, yeah, it's not funny, but I'm going to laugh, so he'll move along. Um, I'm talking like a madman. And he says, with far greater labors he says it's not been easy I have had to work and labor and toil and strive this has not been life on easy street for me and oftentimes as a Christian that's our view we'll serve God and all of a sudden it's perfect as somebody that's been serving the Lord the last 25 years fully but been in church my whole life That's not been my story. Paul says it's not my story either. I've had far greater labors. And he says this, far more imprisonments. Now that's a good thing to brag about. I've been in jail more than any of you guys. That's what Paul is saying. He said, they're servants of Christ. I'm a better one. 
I have not been free. As a matter of fact, a lot of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote from the confines of his prison cells. A lot of what we have in the New Testament is a letter written from prison. Did you realize that? He says, I've had far more imprisonments. Now it gets fun. I've had countless beatings. I don't have a very good pain tolerance. As a matter of fact, as a child, before I knew I was getting a spanking, I used to load my pants with toilet paper in the back to allow a little bit of a buffer. How many people did that? Hey, thank God I wasn't the only deceitful one. That, But Paul says, I've been beaten countless times. Why? Because he did something wrong? No. He just preached the gospel. As I read through these things, I want you to ask yourself, would I have quit any time in this journey? Would I have said, it's not worth it? Would I have said, I'm done? Sayonara, baby. It's not been easy. I've had far greater labors. I've been in prison. A lot of the time since I've been a Christ follower, I've had countless beatings, oftentimes near the point of death. There's been several times I thought I was dying. And honestly, I was, but God spared me. I've been laying in my own blood. There's a time that I read a story about him that says he was beaten and left for dead, and they thought he was dead. But the saints gathered around him, and they lifted him up. Paul says, there's been times, many times, often times, that I thought this was it for me. Far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I had the 40 lashes minus one. You know, I've talked about that at great length at times, talking about when Jesus was scourged with a cat of nine tails. They would have pieces of stone and shard that would be tied in this rope that would rake across a back and rip the flesh and the sinew off. And that scene, and we've discussed it and we've all seen it in The Passion of the Christ, it's one of the most gruesome scenes, but I still don't think it did it justice. Paul said, I've had that five different times. There's five times that I was beaten with a cat of nine tails, 39 lashes. I've endured that five different times. There's three times I've been beaten with rods. Every time I read that, I... Think of a time that I was in Singapore. It's been years ago. You walked out into immigration and they had this sign that says, if you overstay your visa, you will be beaten with a rod five times and it will leave an indelible mark for the rest of, or a, a, a mark, the rest of your life. And I'm thinking, I will not overstay my welcome. I, I'm going to leave when that date says you're out. I'm, I'm good. He says, I have been beaten with rods. Three different times. See, when we picture Paul, we like to picture this put-together person, you know. He looks the part. He's, after all, the apostle. But like Ronnie said, and that's why I felt like that word's for today, Paul was a bondservant. And if you don't get to that place that you realize, I'm a slave for the purpose of Christ. If, I, if I'm doing this for a position or a title, when these things start happening, I'm going to say, I'm done. But he was a servant. He was a slave to Christ. He said, I was stoned once. That was a method of execution. To us, it would be like, I, I, I endured the, le the electric chair one time. I, I was in the gas chamber one time. I, I stood in front of a firing squad once. I mean, may, maybe that's something that can bring it to... Their method of execution was crucifixion or they stoned people to death. Everybody would gather around with rocks and they would hurl them at this person until they were bloodied and dead. That's how they killed people. He said, I went through that one time. Somehow I survived. Are you still on the journey with Christ this morning? 
far greater labors, far more imprisonments. I've been beaten often near death, 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, stoned once. He said, three times I've been shipwrecked. I was joking the other night with somebody. (laughs) They said they had watched the 90s version of the Little Rascals movie. And I said, yeah, I remember that movie. There's a line in that movie that I I used to think was funny. Alfalfa's walking, and it's just been an awful day. And he's walking home, and I think Darla's broken his heart, and he's just had a rough day. And as he's walking, it just starts pouring on him. And he says, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, God opens up the sky and says, I hate you, Alfalfa. (laughs) Obviously, God loves us. But can you see... Paul has really walked through it. Three times shipwrecked. One of those times I spent in a night and a whole day adrift at sea. I think I'd be afraid to get on a boat. But this is his story. He said, I've had frequent journeys. There's been very few times I've got to be at home in the comfort and ease of my own home. I, I don't get that time to sit back and play Xbox and uh, veg out in front of Netflix and just, you know, just sit and have a night for myself. I'm constantly on frequent journeys, and when I'm there, I'm in dangers from rivers, from robbers, people always taking my stuff. I'm in danger from my own people. I'm in danger from the Gentiles. If I'm in the city or the wilderness, I'm in danger... At sea, I'm in danger from false brothers. He says, in toil, in hardship. That's the understatement of the century after what we've been reading. I want you to picture him. What do you see as you see this man? I see somebody that's pretty much disfigured. He carries the scars and the scabs of life. He carries the bruises and the open sores from the things that he's endured, the beatings, the lashes, the stoning. This is not somebody that's pretty to look at. He's walked through some things. And then he says, I've had many a sleepless night. The older I get, man, that's hard. You might think, well, that's okay. You didn't sleep a night. I'm telling you, when I was 20, I could miss sleep for a night, and I'd be fine. Go all day. When you're in your mid-40s, it's a different. It'd take me two, three weeks to catch up on that missed night sleep. How many people, you know what I'm talking about? It's like that. that's one of the most brutal things imaginable. He says, I spent many nights sleepless. There's been times I was hungry and thirsty, often without food. I, I didn't even have anything to eat. In cold and exposure, no roof over my head, just serving Jesus. Feeling the pressure and anxiety in me for all the churches. The internal anxiety and mental anguish that ministry brings. I had no idea what that was until I became the pastor of this church. I'm not saying I can relate fully to what Paul's saying, but in some ways I can. You know, when you're in ministry, when you walk through something, I hope you know this. There's no way for us to not walk through that with you. I carry that with you. If you're hurting, I I feel that pain. And Jenny and I weep a lot just carrying things that we know that you're carrying. Paul was an apostle over so many churches, and he carried the weight of that. He says, there's one time they were going to get me and they let me down in a basket outside of a window through a wall. Would you have dropped off anywhere along the road here and said, I'm I'm done. I, I think I've served my time. It's somebody else's turn. I need a successor. I'm going to Bali. I need a vacation. I quit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, on down, Paul says, and I, and I had this thing to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of revelations. I had a thorn in my flesh. It was a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I said, God, take this away from me. 
just like I said at the beginning, how often when we find ourselves in these places, that's our prayer that we echo. God, get this away from me. This hurts. This is not fun. I didn't ask for this. Get it away from me. Paul says, I've prayed three different times that God would do that and that it should leave. I'm telling you, we're talking today about God's view of suffering. Now, I want you to hear me on this, and you may disagree, and that's okay. It's the wrong prayer to pray, and I'll tell you why, although it seems like the right one. And sometimes we've even developed theologies that said, if you're walking through something, then you've done something wrong to deserve this. Or, worse yet, you just don't have enough faith. And if you had more faith, then you wouldn't walk through this. If that's the case, Paul had as little faith as anybody that I've ever known. I don't believe it's an issue of faith. I think it's an issue of perspective. And Paul learns it in such a powerful way. I'm not saying it can't ever be an issue of faith. But the wrong thing to pray is, God, take it away. The sermons that make people get up and shout are usually about blessing and outpouring. But sermons on commitment and suffering, they're not that exciting. But when we get those things deep down on the inside of us and start living for the kingdom, I really think it's the indication that you've become spiritually mature. Because we're living for something far greater than ourselves, And it's truly an indication that the Spirit of God is truly missing or moving. It's an indication that the Spirit of God is truly moving. I want you to make it. And I said that's the wrong thing to ask. What's the right question? I can tell you from my own life and experience and from what Paul is going to teach us, the right question is, what are you saying, God? Because oftentimes when we find ourselves in those places, we misperceive and think that God has abandoned us or He's forsaken us or He has failed us in some way. But that's the furthest thing from the truth because Jesus made us a promise years ago. He said, I promise you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the earth. What's the right question what are you saying God I shared this a couple of months ago when dad was in the hospital and he had had this massive stroke and I tried to pray and I couldn't and I got to this place I hated what it was I was walking through I didn't understand I was frustrated and I had this heart cry that really wanted to come out. And I tried to utter these words to say what it is that I wanted God to do. But what came out was, God, what? And before I could even say, what? God says, I know my son. Trust me and surrender to me. And my prayer became, Lord, glorify your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Paul says, I prayed that God would take this away from me multiple, multiple times. And he didn't do it. But here's what he spoke to me in the midst of it. In verse 9 of chapter 12, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul has learned these lessons after walking through the most intense suffering that anybody could ever walk through. And he's formed this different view of life. And he's now become more concerned about the kingdom, even more so than getting out of the situations that he's in. As a matter of fact, I want you to think about this in light and context of what we're talking about 
in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says this, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. Yeah, you know what? When he first started that passage, I'm talking like a madman. Now you are a madman, Paul. What are you talking about? But he's telling the church at Colossae, now, see, I've learned some things. I've learned that God's grace is going to get me through this. I've learned that when I'm weak, His power comes upon me. I've learned that when I'm in the midst of trial and suffering, that God has built me a platform that I wouldn't be able to reach somebody any other way. Now, because of that, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is the church to which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the Word of God fully known. Wow! Now, I know that's not just going to make you want to shout, but it should. Paul says, now because I understand as I walk through things, I have a unique ability to stand on a platform and to proclaim the goodness of God to you because of that, to make the Word of God fully known. Now, hallelujah, I rejoice in my sufferings for the opportunity to make Jesus' name great through this. Wow. Wow. Like I said in the beginning, did you realize that one of the greatest platforms you will ever have for Christ is the suffering and the trial that you're walking through right now? Well, you may say, I, I don't know about that. I promise you it's the case. People are watching you in the midst of what you're walking through. And they're waiting to see, is that really real? Because if that faith doesn't hold and stand in the midst of the suffering, I'm not for sure it was really faith in the first place. It should arise on the inside of us and make us realize, God, you have built me a platform. But instead, and I'm just like you, I scream, I pray, I pound the floor, God, take this away from me! Let me tell you what God's doing. He's raising up a last day's army right now that's more concerned about the kingdom than they are their own comfort and ease. And a lot of the things that are being fought for right now in our nation, in our world, it's not the kingdom, it's our com us being comfortable and at ease in the midst of us because we don't want to suffer for Jesus. We don't want to have to pay a price. I want it to be comfortable Guys, I tell you, and I say it prophetically, and if you think I'm wrong, that's fine. The days of comfortable Christianity have ceased. And we are fighting for this. Make it comfortable. No, it's not coming again. We will have to pay a price for Jesus. We're going to have to suffer for Jesus. And when we do, God's saying, I've given you a platform, not something to punish you. It's a platform to make my name great. Man, that's exciting to me. And I did this in midweek manna the other day. But I want us to recap this. And just to kind of back up what I'm saying, because over and over and over, the blind man, that the disciples come upon and say, hey, Jesus, who sinned here? Was it his parents? Was it him? How is he blind? And Jesus says, oh, you're misunderstanding. This has happened that the glory of God can be revealed. You telling me that this man suffered just for this moment that God's name could be made great? No, I'm not telling you that. That's what Jesus is actually telling you. <laughs> well, that's not the God. Yes, actually it is. He cares more about his glory than he does our comfort. <sighs> told you this wasn't fun Paul and Silas I want you to listen to one of these accounts of suffering in verse 16 of chapter 16 of Acts I want us to work our way through this as they're going to the place of prayer they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling she followed Paul and us crying out these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, at first glance, that seems like, hey, that's pretty good. Thanks. They got their own little pep club right behind them, you know. 
That's not what it was. She was operating in a demonic spirit trying to cause distraction. And she kept going. And go, these men are servants of the Most High. And he couldn't even preach. He couldn't do any. It's like a little dog yapping at their heels. And Paul finally got sick of it. It's like a road trip that we're on in our kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? Don't you love that? When you have a 20-hour road trip and you're 20 minutes into the trip, are we there yet? No, Trey. We're not even close. I got to go to the bathroom. Son, we just pulled out of the driveway. These servants are the men of the Most High God. And Paul gets sick of it, just like you've done in the front seat, turned around. Stop it! Richie, you need the fruit of the Spirit. I agree. And this she kept doing for many days. He's more patient than I was and more patient than you are too. And Paul becomes greatly annoyed. She was pestering the fire out of him. And he turns around and says, In the name of Jesus, come out! He was done. He was done playing around. I've tried that on the road trip before. <laughs> Are we there in the night? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she has he has absolutely had it, and it came out of her that very hour. In verse 19, when her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone. See, this was a little cash cow, a little money maker for them. They seized Paul. Here's the suffering that starts. What has he done other than preached? They're going to pray. They seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them before the marketplace, before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They were falsely accused. After all, Satan's good at that. He's the accuser of the brethren. These men are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that's not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowds joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave them orders to be beaten with rods. That's one of the three times that Paul says, I was beaten with rods. Here's one of them. These guys were going to pray and they rebuked a demon out of a girl. They dragged them before the court. They stripped them naked and they beat them with rods. How many people at that place, you starting to get a little discouraged? Not, not been the best of days, you know. <sighs> Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I mean, just like you start getting down in it, you start the phone text messages. I'm just going to quit. I'm done. <laughs> this is so hard. I'm done. I quit. I've quit a long time. I've quit a million times. Just like that song, I get down, I get up again. <laughs> Paul says, okay, this has not been the best of days. When they had inflicted many blows. Now, you know, we use a little vernacular here. A couple of blows, that's two. A few blows, that's three. Many blows. I remember spankings as a child. <laughs> I, I won't go there. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they lost count. They threw their rear ends in prison and they ordered the jailer to keep them safely. He put them in the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks. Let's look at this day. We're going to pray. I cast a demon out of somebody. Great church service, right? Get dragged before the court. They strip me naked. They beat me with rods many times. They threw me in prison. And now I'm sitting there in the stocks with a guard watching us. Suffering. But what Paul was about to realize, it wasn't a punishment, it was an honor. God was actually building him a platform that day. 
And how often we miss that because we think we're being punished. How often we get lost in that place, guys, where we think, God, you failed us. Where are you? This hurts. Let me promise you something. Paul was hurting. He was bleeding. And I'm sure this enemy was lying to him. There's something wrong with you. That's a lie I go through when I'm walking through a trial. There's something wrong with you, Richie. You're not like everybody else. Anybody else ever been there? Yeah, that would never happen to them. They have more faith than you do. This wasn't an issue of faith. God was building a platform for this man. And I've thought about times that I threw in the towel, and I'm done. That's not what Paul did. As he's in the stocks, bloodied, naked, in prison, that's not what Paul did at all. Actually, they started raising a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. And as they heard this bloodied man, I raise a hallelujah. The other prisoners started looking like, do what? Excuse me? In the presence of my enemy. Whew, man. Mm. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Oh, I'm going to sing in the middle of this storm. Louder and louder, I'm going to let my praises roar. Woo! Whew, man, I got goosebumps on top of goosebumps. I got a gander on in my arm here. <laughs> got a gander of goosebumps. Because Paul got something. He wasn't being punished. He was standing on a platform to start talking about Jesus in the midst of his suffering, guys. And how, uh, God, get me out of here. Stop. I don't like this. That's the Richie method. But it wasn't the Paul method. If you need the verse about midnight, I love that symbolism of that dark time. Right as the clock's turning, they were praying and singing, and the prisoners were listening to them. I guarantee you they were a bloodied man that was beaten within an inch of his life that's sitting there stark naked in the stocks, start singing to God. You're going to start listening. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and he drew his sword. Whoops, I've skipped over like three verses. All the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that they had escaped. Now picture that. They're praising. That's good. That's really good. Getting that mental game on, you know, Lord, I'm going to trust you anyway. I'm going to sing praises in the spirit of heaviness. I put on the garment of praise. Lord, I'm going to pray even though it's hard. I don't want to, but it's hard. And there's an earthquake and it shakes loose. And all these prisoners, not just Paul and Silas, all the prisoners were sitting there and their chains are unfastened and the doors open to the prison. And somehow the jailer was asleep in the midst of this. I don't understand that. But he wakes up and rouses himself. And he's about to draw his sword. He's like, oh my gosh, there's been a prison break. 
escape from Alcatraz has happened on my watch, and they're all gone. Picture this. These people are in prison. The doors are open. The guards are asleep. The chains are unfastened. But nobody left. Not just Paul and Silas. Nobody left. What? Every prison break movie I've ever seen, any prison break TV show, you're out of there, baby. You don't even have to dig a tunnel like Andy Dufresne. You just walk on out. They didn't. Why? Because Paul had commanded their attention by the platform he was standing on at that moment. As a bloodied, naked man is singing praise to God in the stocks and the chains fall off. Not a prisoner moved because they were captivated in that moment. They had the struggle. That was the arrest and all the things we talked about to, the, to getting in the stocks. Now we see the witness, which I think it's the greatest sermon Paul ever preached. And now we have the testimony. They're all sitting there as the song is ended. The jailer's about to kill himself. And Paul says, don't do that. We're right here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he falls down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and sir, and he says this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This guy walks into this heavy moment of the Holy Spirit as Paul decides that it's about the kingdom, it's not about me. I raise a hallelujah. The prisoner's like, what? And they start listening. The chains fall, the earthquake. The jailer, I'm going to kill myself, they're gone. No, don't do that. We're all right here. We're just talking about something. And the guy runs over, falls on his face and says, I got to know Jesus. How in the world are you doing this? See, I think we've missed it. Because oftentimes we're in the prison. And while we're in the prison, we lose heart. And we get discouraged or we lose our focus off what it's supposed to be, which is the kingdom of God and winning souls for the kingdom of God. He's not willing that any should perish. And we kind of internalize. Well, I'm walking through something right now. I can't really serve in this area. I don't even need to go to church right now. I'm just really walking through it. And we take our eyes off of the world and we put it on ourselves and we miss the kingdom in the midst of it. Or the great earthquake happens, and that's fantastic. I love those moments of the glory of God when they just fall. I love that. And then we start building churches around the earthquake. But there's something beyond the earthquake. They didn't say, hey, how about another earthquake service? This is great. No, they brought it to the kingdom, and this man falls on his face and says, I got to get saved. Where's the salvations today, I get asked. My question is, where's the platforms that Christians are supposed to be standing on? How have it, has it been that we've lost our focus on the world in the midst of our trial? So this jailer is there and he's on his face. i got to know Jesus. And Paul's like, hey, it's easy from here. And a naked, bloodied man <laughs> leads a jailer to Jesus and here's what happens. The jailer takes him to his home and they walk into the home and he says, family, gather around. Come here, jailer junior. Jailorette junior. All of his kids and his wife gather around. Paul, tell them what, what you just told me. And the entire family gets saved. And then that night it says, we need to get baptized. The entire family gets baptized. And they nurse up Paul's wounds. They didn't do that until after the service. That's what God's wanting to do again. 
He's wanting us to carry the weighted presence. But I'm telling you, before we can get there, we've got to learn how to walk through suffering in the right way. Because if we throw our hands up in the midst of it and quit, what we're telling the world is God is not big enough to take care of this. Or they're not real. And I get it. I've quit a million times. It's the greatest platform we've been given. I can tell you something. Paul could have gone and gone cold door knocking. It's witnessing time. Hey, you want to come to our church? Who are you? And that works sometimes. That's great. Thank God for the souls that come by any means necessary. There's one way that jailer gets reached that night. There's one way his family gets baptized that's not that night. And it's a guy walking through suffering that kept his eye on Jesus in the midst of it. And he preaches the greatest sermon he's ever preached. And they fall on their face. I wonder, now think about this. Now who cares what time it is. Was there any other means that night that that would have happened? Is there any other way that that could have happened? We live in a country that is so gospel hardened. There's some places that still haven't heard the name Jesus. I believe that and I believe it's right here in this country. But the majority of the problem in this country is gospel hardening. Hardening, that's a word, there we go. Hardening's not, hardening is. They've heard it, they've rejected it, they've moved on, or they've experienced hypocrisy and said, I want no part of that Jesus. Am I telling the truth, church? When the problem is, we haven't portrayed Christ in the right manner. We've lost the attractiveness of Jesus. And let me tell you, there is nothing to reject about Jesus. I just really believe that. And I put a Facebook post this week. Somebody refuted it. That's fine. But what I personally believe, the majority of people that reject Christ is because of his followers, not because of Jesus. There's nothing to reject about him. He's love. He's peace. He's joy. He's forgiveness. He's deliverance. He's acceptance. He's wholeness. There's some people that will reject him, absolutely. The rich young ruler did. There's always going to be those people. I think the majority of people in this country reject him because of us. We haven't portrayed him in the right manner. But you walk through a trial like Paul did, sitting in the shackles, bloodied. That commands attention because every prisoner there and the jailer says, now that's real. You can't fake that. That's not a put on right there. That right there is genuine. Where's the genuine faith? Because here's where I started. Your suffering will be the greatest platform you ever had for Jesus. What platform are you standing on right now? And I want you to think about that in your own life. What am I walking through? Right now, some of you, it may be the greatest trial of your life. It may be the greatest suffering in your life. My question to us is, I'll put it on me as well, how are we carrying Jesus in the midst of it? Have I internalized and kind of checked out? God, take this away from me. Take this away from me. Take That's okay. Paul went through that process too. God, take this away from me until he writes the church in Colossae and he said, hey, now I will glory in my sufferings because it's a chance to make the Word of God fully known to you and that's what I want. I will count it all joy, my brothers. See, we hear that and it just repulses it. We don't want to have to do that. We want it to be ease and comfort. And following Jesus just is not that. But you walk how, you learn how to walk through suffering in the right way, carrying his glory and keeping your eyes on the kingdom even more than your own life. 
God can change the world with you. He can change the world with you. He can change the world with you. And I'm thinking about the platforms that I've prayed away. God, get this away from me. Lift this, God. I rebuke it. And there's times I need to rebuke the enemy. But what I don't ever want to rebuke is the platform that he's built for me to make his name great with. My focus has been on the wrong thing. Like I said, the right prayer to pray is, God, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying in the midst of this suffering? Do I need to resist? Do I need to rebuke? Or do I need to stand and proclaim the greatness of our God naked and bloodied in a prison? If that's it, Lord, bring it. I'll do it. What platform are you standing on right now? Because church, if we don't get this right in the culture we live in, we won't amount to much for Jesus. We'll throw our hands up at the first sign of trouble. And Jesus said that's what it's going to look like. Even the very elect will be deceived. We're in those times. You want to make it to the end. You learn how to thrive in the midst of whatever you find yourself in and keep your eyes on Jesus. I told you I'm talking on these heavy things because I want you to make it more than I want you to be comfortable and excited. I want you to endure. I don't want to pick up your bloodied carcass on the side of the road of life. I want us to walk hand in hand together and cross the finish line. And I'm telling you, if we don't get this right, we're missing it. <sighs> wow. Lord, your word is absolutely empowering and amazing. And I know that this is not what we want to hear at times. It's so easy to... <laughs> it's so easy to walk the other way. It is so, so easy to walk the other way and to not live for you. It's easy to mm, find the easy way out. Lord, it's easy to just to miss it. It's easy to quit at times. It's easy to get disillusioned. It's easy to pray the prayers like Paul did take this away from me. It's hard to endure. But man, it's empowering to find that sufficient grace in the midst of it. It's life-giving. Jesus, so life-giving to find our sufferings as a platform for you. And to have that view like Paul did to make up in our bodies What's lacking? Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying over every situation in this place right now? What are you saying over every trial, Lord? We shouldn't be taken back by the fact that there's trials and struggles. You told us they would be there. In this life, you'll have struggles, you'll have tribulation, you'll have trials. They're to come. How we walk through them will define our effectiveness for the kingdom of God. Lord, I don't condemn anyone that's discouraged, that's thrown their hands up and quit. I've been there a million times. But it's time for that hallelujah to be raised in the prison cell of suffering that we find ourselves in today. We live that view of life. There's nothing like it. Mm. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I know I'm I can feel the Holy Spirit moving in this place right now. And I want to ask this because I can feel it. Jesus. Who is it that would say, I'm in the fight of my life right now? 
I'm bloodied and naked in a prison cell of darkness, and it's the midnight hour. I am in that place, the fight of my life, and I'm suffering and I'm struggling, and all I want it to do is leave. But right here in the midst of it, I devote it to God, and I seek His voice, and I let my song rise in the midst of the darkness today. I need His sufficient grace to walk through it. And I need His wisdom to point to Him, to stand on the platform that He's given me in the midst of my pain, to point others to God. More than anything, I want to devote my circumstance to Him that His glory can move through it. That the glory of God can be revealed through me. And I devote myself if suffering is the way where people will come to me and fall on their face and accept Jesus, then I'll walk through it. But I'm in the fight of my life and I need Him right now in the midst of it. If that's you, would you just stand to your feet because we're going to pray for you. Just like Paul. Yeah, there's people already standing. It's time, guys. There's people already standing. You're not going to be alone. There's trials all over this place. There's fires all over this place. Just like Paul was left and bloodied for dead, the church gathered around him and they lifted him up. My goodness gracious. When that happened, he made it. That's what the body of Christ is for. We're going to make it when we stand in this thing together. And right now, I'm going to pray a prayer. Is there anybody else? I need that victory in my life. I'm walking through it. I'm bloodied in a prison cell and I've lost my song. I need it to arise again. I don't want to rush if there's more. Is there more? I devote it to Him. I've been pleading for Him to take it away. And that's an appropriate prayer. But a greater prayer is, God, what are you saying? And help me to be faithful in the midst of it. Is there anybody else? My goodness. Paul and Silas was one platform. Man, if every one of these platforms, if we did the same thing, whew, that's revival right there, man. That's it. Let's pray. If you're around somebody standing, pray with them. Gather around them as they gathered around Paul. As they gathered around Paul. Let's gather around the body right now. Whew. Jesus, mm, you are good, God. And you're faithful, Lord. Lord, you've not left us. You've not forsaken us. I know it's not been easy. And there is a victory for God's people. But the true victory is found by finding His grace in the midst of it. Oh, God, you are faithful, Lord. Right now, Jesus... bloodied, naked in a prison cell, in the stocks, at the midnight hour. Lord, we raise our hallelujah. And we devote ourselves to you, Jesus. Right now, God, we ask for you to speak. What are you saying, Lord? What are you saying right now, Lord? We need to hear your voice. And I pray the platforms that you've given the people in this church, no matter how arduous, no matter how difficult and painful, Lord, may we be faithful to proclaim the greatness of our God in the midst of the darkest night. And I pray, Jesus, you have the world pay attention again. Let him see the reality of who Jesus is because that's who he really is. That's who Jesus really is right there. He's the one that sustains us in our prison cell. He's the one that empowers us in the midst of our prison. He's the one that gives us joy and a song in the midst of our suffering and pain. That's a platform. And help us to stand on it and be bold as lions. Help us to stand on it and be bold as lions for your kingdom, Lord. Lord, and I know messages like this are not fun to hear. 
but it's true. And that's what will sustain us with what we're in, with what's to come. Learning how to manage suffering. Learning how to thrive in the midst of our cell. We devote it to you, Lord. We devote it to you, Jesus. We devote it to you, God. Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you for your presence in the midst of the darkest nights, Lord. And just as a church body, Lord, obviously, if we had a choice, Lord, we would choose the easy path in our flesh. But what we choose today is you. And we say, make your name great. Your kingdom come, your will be done regardless of the path that's to come. And yes, we recognize, Lord, the source of evil and attacks and all of that. Lord, we know the enemy wants to steal from us, kill us, and destroy us, and we rebuke him, we resist him. And when we do, he'll flee. But we devote ourselves to you, Lord. Whatever's to come, make your name great through us, through our circumstance, through our marriages, through our lives, through our homes, through our work, and even through our suffering. Make your name great in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I love you all very much. And we'll see you next week right here at 10 o'clock.